Well, especially now that you've built this, you can kind of like do yeah, that. Yeah, I can. More. I can be away more. Yeah, I definitely have a very competent team too. That's something I want to talk a little over. bit about. So, yeah. Um, yeah, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Welcome to Frame One. I'm Dryson. Today I'm hanging out with Aaron Sarovsky. First off, thank you so much for being on the show. I am really excited to have you here. I'm so excited to be here <laughs> in my space with in your you. own studio. But we've known each other for a while. It's we nice have. to um to be a part of. Yeah, we we have we have. Uh, so Frame One, the goal is to explore the emotional journey you experienced as you started Sarovsky. Okay. Um, this is completely unscripted. I didn't bring notes even. So okay. wherever this goes, is completely yeah. where it goes. Uh, but I want to make sure I've got like your story figured out. Um, okay. You grew up in New York. I grew up in New York. Got your Bachelor's of Fine Arts in uh, Computer Graphics. True. Moved to Chicago for a gig with Digital Kitchen. Yep. Worked up from, was it intern? I mean, I was getting Roll. paid, okay, so okay. I was a very junior designer. But moved yeah. through the ranks mm -hmm. all the way up to creative director. Yep. Uh, left that gig, uh, went back to New York for Superfab for a couple of years. Yep. Came back to Chicago for Regis Farms. Rebus Farms. Rebus Farms. Yep. That was a very, very, very quick thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, but then in 2009, started Sarovsky. Yeah. Yeah. How did I do? You did very good. Um, I went. I grew up on Long Island, which is a very specific part of New York, so I feel like I need to say that. And I went to school at RIT. I got my undergraduate in graphic design and then my master's in computer graphics. Got so it. I think the foundations of design is probably maybe what set me apart, I think, at the time. I could imagine. I feel like the design side has always been the the struggle because I was, I've was i never been formally trained in design. And overcoming that, yeah. that's hard. It's hard because if you, as a... As a trained designer, like you don't have to be as good of an animator. <laughs> well, I mean, it's really true because your design decisions, like you realize maybe erring on the side of simplicity is better and you can lean on typography and color and composition. Um, I was teaching for a little while here at the School of the Art Institute while I was at Digital Kitchen, so okay. like very former life. And one of my first exercises I would give my students was just like with just to learn the timeline and connection with music. Yeah. Is in the timeline just with solids and edits like cut connect visually to the music. So it's literally just like turning on and off colors. You know, sometimes I get crazy and break them off and do things like that. But it was a really cool assignment because the work always looked so amazing and it was like nothing. You know what I mean? But because you were developing a connection with the music and color and simple layout choices. You're getting a feel for storytelling through just color. Just color. And it was, it's a great introduction. And, but those are, that's like a team of, you know, or I say a team because I think in teams, but all the students were designers just yeah. getting some exposure to movement mo motion. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of want to jump into the early days back in digital kitchen. Uh, I heard or read somewhere that when you were there, you had like one of the highest win rates for pitching. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the rumor I heard from one of the producers <laughs> there probably in what year did I hear that? It would have been in like the early 10s okay. that I heard okay. that. I was like, Hey, well, you're still the highest grossing you know, designer. So I'm curious. Board, so, you know, so favorites. having that, was that uh, mainly led because of the designs were just really well? Was there a communication aspect or what from that did you take that really helped you in, you know, starting Swarovski itself? Well, in order to get work, you have to win work. <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> kind of makes sense. And I, while I was there, I kind of worked on like the whole, not just doing the boards, but um, the whole pitch process process the packaging like what that looked like so yeah. it was like a big part of a couple times they're reinventing what that looked like and how that worked so like aesthetically i kind of knew what was going on and but then just doing the boards i think one of the things early on that i was doing wrong was i was had all these different ideas and i would always try and put them in a board yeah you know and there was a moment where i whether it was through a creative director's help or maybe my own realizations or some amalgamation thereof, I realized like, oh, each of these ideas is a separate board. Yeah. And I stopped being so precious actually about the design and started focusing more on like, okay, here's one idea for how this deodorant could come in. And hey, here's another idea for how this deodorant could come in. And here's another idea for how this deodorant can come in. And then maybe I'll do the type layout a little different each time. And it was like a lot easier for somebody to point at something and say, yeah, that, 
And as a result, the work got a little simpler looking, again, leaning on design and composition. And yeah, so because at that time, things were going from really busy aesthetically to more minimal. Okay. From okay. like the more, just trying to think, like 90s <laughs> aesthetic into the 2000s aesthetic, which yep. was more Apple. Yep. So we were very much a, a part of how to simplify. And, and as a result, things would just win. And, and part of that would be because instead of, whereas another artist or designer would be producing a board, I would produce like five. Right. So you had options. You could do yeah. the whole like the I freeze just rule or whatever boop, boop, it is. Boop. Yeah. And even here now, like when everybody does boards, I try not to do them <laughs> because I don't, like I'm a creative director. I want my team to make the boards and I want to direct them. Yeah. Uh, but every once in a while, I'll see like a sliver of something that isn't, that should be explored but isn't and i'll just go and boop knock out a board and i i call it like a filler board because sometimes it's a board that helps a client realize like the one the transition piece of the one extra little thing better okay but they won't get to that one if they don't see something that kind of helps them on their way the so, stepping stone yeah so th i think that's probably why and I listened to the client. I wasn't pushing my own agenda or even like what I perceived to be the DK agenda. I was doing things that I heard in the brief that the client wanted. You're truly listening and truly being yeah, an advocate of them, yeah. being a designer, not an artist. Totally. Like a brief driven project that is. So really listening to the brief. I love that. Know. I love that. So spend some time at DK, worked your way up to be creative director, uh, left, did a sit back in New York at Superfab, and then came back for, for Rebus Farms. Yeah. Uh, I want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because mm -hmm. I want to spend the most of it on, on Swarovski yeah. itself. But I'm curious, uh, because that was a short stint, didn't quite go the way you intended. Were there lessons that you learned from that uh, experience that that helped you in starting Swarovski? Yeah, so this isn't something I often talk about. I usually glaze over Rebus because it's, you know, kind of tumultuous, which is maybe why I shouldn't glaze over it. <laughs> but it was a partnership with two other partners coming back, which kind of drew me away from Superbad in New York. I, I wanted to leave. I wanted yeah. to come back to Chicago. And this kind of gave me the confidence to be able to do that. We had a rep that was willing to rep us. And, you know, it it felt very stable and like a good idea. Um, but it was a partnership of three. And I was the creative director and maker, person making the work, um, along with whatever freelancers we yeah. hired. Um, one person was supposed to be doing business development and one was executive producer. And it's just really hard. I was the person like kind of doing most of the things as the maker, you know. Right. It was being run out of my condo here. It was really um, an interesting experiment. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, everybody goes into a project or a, like a, a company aligned, like excited. Yeah. Everyone's best friends. This is going to work. We're going to be the next major studio. Yeah. Well, for us, though, I, like I think for me, I just knew it was going to be a lot of hard work okay. <laughs> because I knew what it was to make work. Right. And I also knew that I was going from Digital Kitchen and Super Fad that were making Super Bowl commercials and Emmy winning main title sequences to like literally starting over. Right. So like early conversations would be, oh, you worked on that spot at Super Fad, put it on the website. And it was like, no, we will get sued. That is right. not our work. It's not our intellectual property. Well, we need to be able to show that. Well, we can't show that. That does not represent the work we can do. Yes, I worked on that, but also the whole team at Superfed did. So I think like maybe looking back, there were some like obvious warning signs, maybe warning signs. But I think, you know, we all went into it really excited. And like 2007, eight was a really hard year. So was it seven, eight or eight, nine? Either way, Se not either a great way. time to be not doing a great much time things. to be starting a business. And I, you know, actually we were doing really well. That's we awesome. had no overhead. We were all taking home a decent amount of money a month and paying the bills and growing slow, but it just like wasn't enough. I right. think for me, I was in a place in my life, I was maybe just turning 30 okay. or just before. And and I didn't need much. I didn't have a family. I had my little condo. It just like wasn't a yeah. lot in overhead for me, but for my other partners, it, it was a big jump and it just wasn't enough. And there was a lot of pressure on them to all of a sudden have to get income outside of that. And as soon as that happens, things like fracture. Right. Also, I was a single person. They're both married. So it it just changes the dynamic. It's a different uh, yeah. financial situation. Yeah. So I'm trying to like look back 
on it like more graciously than I was in it. But, you know, at the end of the day, like when one of your partners is basically like, okay, I'm going to go get a full time job, but I'm still getting a third of everything when (laughs) you're literally like seven months into it. It was kind of like, no, yeah, not how it's going to go. So did you kind of wash your hands and step away then? So I finished my obligations through the company and I just started doing some freelancing on the down low. It was the end of the year. Okay. And, um, and I was like, actually like in like the worst place I'd ever been in, in my life, because at that point there were some pretty big production companies like looking to sign me as a director. And I was very much like, but I'm not a director. I'm a creative director. And to be a great creative director, you need a great team. And I can't just be on a roster somewhere without a team. Right. And people were like, I don't know. It just, I just like, wasn't, <laughs> I was so, I was back in Chicago. I was ready to be back in Chicago. I was really excited about it. And it just felt like I was in a coliseum and then it was like all falling down around me kind of thing. And then, I don't know, I, it's like, the holidays happened and january started and somebody reached out and was like hey i want to you know work with you and your company and i was like oh there's no more company (laughs) and he was like well go start another company it's you that we want to work with you'll put together your team that you need so were these relationships built from like rebus or from dk that came together or just out of the blue they were relationships that i that had been started very like early on okay pre- previous to rebus okay for sure um but yeah they and i was just like no it's like not like a thing and he's like oh go start a company and that's why the company name is Sarovsky because um there would then be no question if i was or wasn't working for rebus anymore <laughs> right like it's very clear very cut clear that, point. that things have moved on um but also i didn't have time to think of something i literally had to go to the courthouse and fill in some paperwork and get this thing done like tomorrow yeah get it it was literally like yoga pants courthouse getting paper signed to be a corporation that your like lawyer puts together for you and you're off and running with your ein and everything right right and so that's why it's like sarovsky corp it's like the (laughs) silliest (laughs) thing ever i don't have time to brainstorm names names. and you know we have put a lot of thought into rebus farms and i always loved the idea of what a rebus was you know and kind of piecing things together yep. and farms being a place where real work is done. Yep. And yep. Grow things we, from nothing. Yeah. And we like hired this amazing artist. Uh, I don't remember her name was Polly. She did these cool things and we had like the funnest logo and, and then I'm just like at the courthouse making this thing. <laughs> and eventually I need a website and I have my friend kind of do that. And I was just very, I imagine it's a lot of stress to happen very quickly yeah. just to get this but job. It wound up being a pretty big job. Yeah. Yeah. And we were needed mostly in LA. And so we four walled at my friend's studio arsenal effects. Okay. And, um, it, it's been a, like a really beautiful friendship, you know, from then on. So we hung out there, we brought some equipment out, some of my trusted freelancers yep, that, yep. and friends that were here in town came with me and we just made a bunch of stuff over and over again. Very high stress, um, big, big graphic jobs, yeah, you yeah. know, um, and it, it was kind of a gamble, but it seemed to have paid off. I yeah. feel like anytime you start a company or a business, it is a gamble. Yeah. And especially in the creative world, like you said earlier, when you start something new, you can't rely on what you did for Digital Kitchen or for Nothing. whatever. It's all... so you've got to come up with brand new, fresh, you know, intellectual mm-hmm. property. Starting that, looking at that wall saying, okay, I've just started Swarovski <laughs> today. Yes, I have one job that, I mean, I think is coming through, but you know, you're not really no, sure. No. Yeah. How, like looking at that, that, that thing you have to climb, that mountain, how did you feel? You know, for me, it wasn't a mountain. It was just like, you know what? This thing I did that I thought was going to be a thing is no longer a thing. So it was so low stakes. <laughs> you know, I was happy to be working. I was happy I didn't have to make any bigger decisions about my life, going to work for this place or moving across country. I could start building something very slowly, doing work I believed in with people that I know believed in me because it wasn't, these were people that I knew that were bringing work to me and not, and knowing like the dirty stuff, knowing like this whole thing fell apart and, you know, being supportive. It sounds like just being able to build relationships and being transparent with those relationships really kind of help pay out. And I have to say like the two people behind that job in January, like, 
I bit, literally had a text from one of them this morning and was on the phone with another one this past <laughs> this past week. So that's that's how important relationships are. I love it. I love yeah. it. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, when you first started Swarovski then, uh, how many people did you like immediately jump out and reach, reach out to to have things rolling? Or was it just you? It was it was just me, you know, and my um, accountant and lawyer, <laughs> basically, <laughs> like who I called for everything. Yep. It was like a very important, those were important relationships. I mean, I was just coming out of that bit, that failed business, like very confused. Um, so for me, my lawyer was everything. Um, and then on the accountant side, like I'm a designer. I, d I don't understand how to run a business. So all of every question I had went through him first and was, you know, was at first an email or a text to him and then it turned into a follow up. Okay, well, you should talk to so and so he can or she can help you set up this. And my first actual full time hire was um, Hallie, who she did basically operations, okay, not okay. even an artist, somebody that could just help me, you know, rent a space to get out of my fucking house. You know, <laughs> that was a big thing. Like with partners, they didn't want to spend money on a space. And I'm like, but we're doing this in my home. Like I want to get out of my space. <laughs> like I literally were, do I'm in my home every day. That's like pre pandemic. That yeah. like I, <laughs> you, went, you went through the pandemic twice. <laughs> I, a little bit. You definitely feel trapped, you know? So, so it was nice hiring her, but you know, I had relationships with people at like an EP level. So a great guy named Tommy Leonard came in and helped me, you know, just get the bidding process sorted out. He was yeah. very kind and lovely human to do that. And then I had, of course, good friends like Matt Cernich, who was an amazing animator and visual effects supervisor level person that helped me keep the technology <laughs> together and building a little bit of that. I mean, I think about it then versus what it is now it's like kind of silly you mm -hmm. know but you know technology was definitely a little bit different back then a little harder to wrangle in some ways um than it is now though now the scale is bigger and it's harder <laughs> for a different reason <laughs> but like it's not like you had like google drive where you right. could just like set up a company and be working you're sending tapes back and forth yeah and... we're still like in an era where you got to run to fedex yep. even though there are ftps but it's like oh we have our own ftp like stuff like that where you're cyber ducking things right, you know right. you're not no just throw it on drive and send a link that's it's so it's a different kind of time. different challenges to yeah, overcome back in the day yeah uh, no, I, I totally understand that. Um, I am curious uh, because as I understand from the very beginning, like you wanted to have a studio space like this. Yes. How long did it take to to build this? So the building that we're in now, I bought in 2012. And we oh, so in. like right, like because it's Sarovsky to 09, just three years in. That's yeah, and then so wow. late late 12. Oh, okay, <laughs> so okay. Early I'll give you nine, four years. <laughs> and late 12, and then we weren't in until 13. Were you renting a place before you bought yeah, this one? Yeah, okay. it's right down the street okay. in the West Loop. So we were like very OG West Loopers <laughs> here. Now it's like the hot spot, but nobody would come here before. But it was cheap. It, was, it paid <laughs> out. It paid out. It's cheap. And then, you know, people are like, oh my God, you bought this building. And that's so brave. And at the time, like now, yes, it's like completely brave. But again, like when I did, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a significant other. I just like knew I had saved up a bunch of money. Right. Um, and for me, that meant security to be able to pay people and all the things. And then we were kind of coming up to a point where it was like, God, we need a little more space. You know, like we're we're starting to like outgrow our space and God, rent was so high everywhere. And especially for like a more legitimate space, <laughs> you know? And so I was just like, God, I, you know, you have that thought of like, I could just buy a building and fix it up for what that's going to cost right? me, you know? So then you look into what it is to getting a loan and all the things. And I found this building and it was my real estate guy was like, no, 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 you're not going to want to see that building. And I was like, yes, I do. And he took me to some other buildings and I'm like, I, j I really want to see this building. And he was like, fine, I'll set it up. And we walk in and it is like the dumpiest of dumps. <laughs> like I'll send you pictures so that you can cut it in. I want to see. Yeah. And I literally was like, oh my God, this is it. And That's my cool. real estate agent was like, you are not who I took you for at all. I mean, it was 
the dumpiest like a toilet like laying in the middle of space <laughs> unattached to things and just giant puddles but to me it was a raw clear span space with a barrel roof and six thousand square feet and it was cheap as fucking dirt Get- you know well i mean just I shouldn't just say it like that, but it was, you know, when you broke it up on a mortgage, right, right. it was going to be cheap. And I assume, you know, compared to like renting anywhere in Chicago, because that's not cheap yeah. in the first place. Yeah. And so then, you know, I was like, okay, well, we'll get a loan to build out. And I had a friend who's friends with an architect and it, like, a, there's a whole story there, but like kismet happened and uh, wound up hiring this amazing architect, Mark Olfluff, and yeah. he's at a Tom Kundig's place out in Seattle. So he did... The design and the space and i found a, a good builder who's crazy but a good competent builder and and then i got a loan and it was so funny for you know you get a loan for like it was like 400 grand or something like that for the build out yeah <laughs> yep. and it was like the same amount for the building but um so you get this loan and we close on the loan and it's kind of like I imagine they were just going to give me a briefcase of cash. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what happens when you get a construction loan. It's actually a very complicated process to, and Hallie was instrumental in this where, you know, you had a certain allotment that you could spend on your roof and a certain yep. allotment you could spend on your, so everything, but everything had to go through like notar- notarization and tracking and you know, basically approval before you spend the money. And it's really, I don't know. I think I prefer the, the suitcase company. of cash. <laughs> I know. I, ju- I literally thought they were just going to hand me a check or a briefcase of money. And we're going to be like, okay, see, we go. you know, start paying it back. But not the case. Not the case at all. Yeah. Really shocking. <laughs> so how long did it take to go from build out to finally moving in day one? Not that long, which is crazy. Cause now just doing two rooms over there was taking like <laughs> four months, you know, but, uh, Probably like five months. Well, that's not bad. No. For a full building, you know, uplift. Yeah. I imagine day one, moving in, setting up your computer and your desk and stuff. Talk to me about how that felt. It felt awesome. And we actually had clients here. Really? Um, this guy, Joel. <laughs> uh, so we still have pictures because there was still some construction going on. So we had like traffic cones over, you know, some of the 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 holes in the floor where we were running conduit. Cause I was very like, I don't want to see wires. Right. I'm right. not going to be in a building where there are wires. In right. The so everything was, and you know, we tore out all the concrete and put a heated floor in. We like really went for it. Yeah, no kidding. And, um, and so everything is run underground and I like love that. Yeah. But you know, he was here and it just like had this like really, really special feeling. And then literally like days after that, we won Captain America Winter Soldier. And like, had we not been in this space, they would have probably not given us the job because there's no way we would have passed security in our other that's, space. That's like, so I, I know you've talked about security and, and the, the ins and outs of yeah. working with top companies like this quite a bit on other podcasts and other places. Um, but to have the investment of, that you put into this building and know that that directly led to those types of projects and types of awards. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I didn't know. I was really like kismet. Again, this is like me, the artist, creative director, not me, like the MBA person, like that knows how to run a business and understands like what high security means or anything (laughs) like that. Winter Soldier was the first job we'd ever gotten at, at Marvel or at any kind of security, like required company. So, um, when we, when we got the, like visual effects, you know, pipeline. We also got like the security mandates and they were like, you got to be up to snuff like now and we will help you. But like, you got to do you it. You got to do, gotta do it. You got like basically a couple of weeks and <laughs> and you're running. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things like, oh, like windows can't be facing monitors. And, you know, if you're in a building with other tenants there needs to be a certain kind of security at the door and things like that so there were just things like that that our other space wasn't right, right. where with having our own building we could control the whole paradigm so that's the thing about owning the space and having it be a space that only you occupy is that you can then control the space you know that's really fun to think i never would have considered otherwise yeah um because i know i don't know a lot of companies are doing like co-working spaces and that kind of stuff and it just Never would have considered yeah, that being a detriment is like in that a, way. You know, that is 
It know, is what it is. It's an obstacle. <laughs> it's a big obstacle. So I want to go back kind of 2009, you get started, 2012 or 13, you move into mm-hmm. here. Um, typically, when I've been talking to studio owners, there's that first two to three years, you're kind of figuring things out and then you kind of hit your stride. Yeah. Then after 10 years, like you're just, you're on top of your game and, and you're running. Uh, to be able to land a Marvel project like three years into your, your studio, yeah. that's a pretty big deal. What do you think led to that success? Um, that's a really good question. Um, it, it like actually might have come a little early. <laughs> like we were ready. F- I think in some ways we were ready for it. And in some ways, like maybe we weren't. Still had some growing to do yet? Yeah, we okay. definitely had a lot of growing up to do. Or at least I had a lot of growing up to do. But um, certainly my my personal experience leading jobs through the DK yeah. and Superfad um, experience and certainly failing at a company really helped me understand at least to like do things properly okay and like really follow through like not just on the creative side but on all the other things as well soft skills your people yeah, people. yeah. okay all of okay that. business so side. i feel like i had like a really great foundation and i i don't know i i feel like creatively i was ready and my my team was very competent very competent but so- um I'm, you know, that's a big delivery. Yeah, that no kidding, big, no kidding. That is a big delivery, and you're moving from, like, a traditional, like, After Effects workflow into a visual effects pipeline, and yeah. that's where Matt Cernich, you know, his experience with, like, he's like, Aaron, shit, like, you got to take this seriously. This, <laughs> like, this, like, I'm, like, thinking about security and, like, some of this other stuff, and, and, and like, okay, how are we going to find the right artist to do this? He's like, this is we're going to need to finish at a nuke and we're going to, you know, like this is like a really it's big a whole, deal, different, a whole world. different thing. And so, um, and it was also a stereoscopic delivery. So he really, were these skills that you had had, had in place at that point or was this kind of a new learning curve for you? I mean, I would say like it was aspects of each of, I feel like <laughs> we had like Matt was skilled in certain ways and, and, and certainly our network could handle it, you know? Um, Because that's probably the answer to your bigger question is like, you know, the few of us that were internal, like really knew that like we needed to hire somebody to consult on the stereo side and that we knew there was no such thing as a stupid question to Marvel, even though it might be embarrassing. Like we just like knew that we needed to ask the right questions and get the right people in. And so that job cost a lot to do. Like, did you make money on it? I'm sh- sure not. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, also, there are some jobs that are about that. And there right. are some jobs that are not about that. Some and of I them are, are for yeah. the, not the, but that's the not because rights. of Marvel. Like, um, they paid a fair market value right. for their <laughs> main title sequence. I would say we, we had to amp up our infrastructure on the security side. We had to, you know, buy probably a ton of nuke licenses and all of that stuff that would historically be supported by so many different jobs, you know, and Got then we it. of course had to pay for some consulting and things like that. But it opened the door to other projects and work down the road to say, Hey, this yeah. is what we're capable of. Yeah. I mean, like, I can't tell you how many times somebody says we want winter soldier for this here <laughs> job, whatever it is. And it's like, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the one I think that will be on the grave yeah today, I, you know? I specifically remember watching Winter Soldier in in theaters my wife we're big Marvel fans yeah. and when when the title sequence came on we're like that was really cool yeah. and it wasn't until like two or three years later I found out that that you did that yeah. and then I was an instant fanboy of Swarovski and have been ever since yeah. um, I am curious how did you even get into the, the, to the position of being able to bid for something like that yeah so that's like what i always try to lean on especially when i'm talking because it's about relationships so my first entertainment job as sarosky was a show called community okay yep yep um i've told this story a little bit before but um i'll do like the reader's digest and if you want me to get into it i will but we got a call from the producer on the show um they were already making a main title and they were struggling (laughs) it wasn't connecting they didn't really like the idea and they were calling just like every main title person he knew to come in and chat with the showrunners and see uh if something else shouldn't be explored instead so 
Um, I happened to be in LA. I, like I said, I was in LA working on that other job. <laughs> so, so he's like, can you come by the studio like the next day and, you know, chat? And I'm like, oh yeah, of course. So it was like an hour before the meeting <laughs> and he, he calls and he's just like, so I'm just curious for your presentation. Do you have like any audio visual thing, video things that you need set up? You need like a TV or something? I'm like, you, you just called yesterday. I'm, I thought this was like a anything. download. I didn't realize we were, I was I'm pitching and he's like, I'm sure it'll be fine. So I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm sure it will not no be fine. So I was just like, well, fuck it. Like back to the whole thing it's just ideas yeah before it is a thing so he had briefed me about the show and i'd read a, a script or two and so i just started writing ideas i still have like the notebook you should frame that yeah <laughs> actually i have the cootie catchers out there you front go there in you my go cloche. um but uh and I just started thinking about what would be an interesting opening, like maybe like waiting in line, like you're at the DMV yeah. and like an oscillating fan and, yeah. you know, you get your Greendale. So I just like came up with all these different ideas. One idea was like rejection letter from Harvard, rejection letter from this. And then like eventually, congratulations, you've been accepted to Greendale Community College. Right. So it's just kind of. One of those things where all of a sudden I'm in this meeting and it's all the tables at the library on the set yep. pushed together. Yep. And it's like the Russos and all the writers and all the producers. And I'm just sitting in the middle and I just like open up my notebook and they're like, what do you got? <laughs> I got so, ideas. I got ideas. So I'm like, okay, so what about like this rejection letter idea? And so I start describing it and it was literally the most fascinating moment of my career where I think like all the stars aligned and I like, be, cause I basically got a look inside a writer's room. Yeah, It's like I got dropped inside a writer's room. So when they look at our boards, now I see what they talk about kind of yeah. without us. You get the there. peek behind the curtain. Totally. And so I kind of love this, you know, rejection letter. And like, oh, one's like, oh, yeah, that's cool. We can like the names can be revealed. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you're totally getting it. And I'm like excited. And then all of a sudden somebody goes, yeah, but even though we have like this group of rejects, we're not rooted in rejection. We're rooted in, you know, something else. And right. it was just interesting. And so like I saw the idea just kind of fall apart, fall apart. So I was like, OK, next idea, blah, blah, blah. You know, and then I got to the cootie catcher idea and one of them were like, what is like, what is that? And I'm like, I don't remember like the fortune tellers. Yeah, yeah. And they were like, I'm like, who's got like a real size sheet of paper? You can so do it real quick. I, like I make it and I'm like, you know, and then for like each cast member, maybe we open and it's like a quirky illustration, but it's like smudged and in big pen because it wouldn't be like a, like a child did it. It's like it would be as if, you know, <laughs> these right, like right. 13th grade, these knuckleheads did it. And they were like that's it that's brilliant so they had me um do boards for two of the ideas which i did i literally just made cootie catchers and took pictures of them <laughs> was the idea you know not even thinking about how we would make it or anything because i wanted to do it stop motion um so they picked the board they were like this is great go make that and so the russos were on that job they were one of you know okay. dan harmel okay. was a writer and kind of genius in a way behind that but the russos made that show happen and um they directed a lot of the episodes and <laughs> produced this amazing thing. So um, that's where the relationship started. Gotcha. So gotcha. When, before um, we move on, I'm going to ask you real quick here. Those ideas you had, did, how many of those were thought out ahead of time versus pulled out of your ass in a moment of? Well, I mean, I had my list of probably about nine ideas. And, you know, when you're talking ideas, other ideas kind of they form like, and formulate form or, oh, yeah, well, that could turn into that. But like you could just see when I was making the cootie catcher like it was like bling 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 like <laughs> the light bulbs like, went off yeah you could just like see it it's That's really fun. it was really special to be able to be in a room and watch that happen absolutely and for me as somebody who so relied on visuals to to get the likes you know it really connected me to like oh no it's the idea like that could have looked like garbage we could have delivered something like less than stellar <laughs> and they still would have loved it because, That's fun to think about. You know what I it's mean? Because idea. it's the idea, you know, so. So then uh, moving forward, the Roosters were there, made that connection, and it kind of led to the Marvel stuff? Yeah, so the Roosters, when they went on to do another pilot, they would call, they did a show called Happy Endings. Okay. That's a great show. Yeah? I totally don't understand how that show is still not airing, because <laughs> David Casp was like the main kind of writer. It was... Uh, 
like every once in a while like i'll <laughs> watch an episode of that show and if i'm so like my my thing is whenever i'm feeling down i'll like watch trampoline fail videos but i'll also watch there's, it's not an insight in your psyche at all no no it's really i mean like i'll just be at the table laughing because the and they're like oh she, she's you know right she right needs to move, she's but there's also um a cold opener to one of their episodes it's like the mrs hitler episode and it is you have like Pause and show it in this in this um, piece because it is is because it, it's a vidcast, okay. right? It's not okay. just a. It is literally the funniest cold opener I've ever seen. I'll is, have to go check it out. Is like happy endings. Yeah, happy endings. Hitler cold open. <laughs> <laughs> like, a man. It's just like the best thing you've ever seen on TV. I I don't under, So we worked on that with them and. You know, we were in the middle of doing, um, finishing up a show that they did called um, Animal Practice. <laughs> you haven't seen it, I'm no, sure okay. of it, but of, <laughs> it was a really fun title sequence that we put together for them. And like right as we were delivering, like a, a variety thing hits my inbox and it's like the Russo brothers to direct <laughs> Captain America, the Winter Soldier. And you're like, yes. I mean, I literally opened an email and I wrote to both of them and I go I'm so happy for you but I'm more happy for me I have always wanted to work on a superhero film so and then I so it was like don't please forget don't your forget girl. your girl <laughs> when it's time and you know it's years away right, you right. know and so they were like of course of course you know and you know eventually you could really tell we were not the preferred vendor because <laughs> we were like company six to come in and but i you know i really appreciate that whatever they did behind the scenes just to get us in the mix yeah you know and it was you know then we were all presenting in person so it was so fun to fly out and just sit in a room with the brothers i and imagine that had to be high stress though too it was so fun because we there was being there was the win. Yeah. The win wasn't the win. Got it. You had right? already, like you we, already accomplished your mission by being in the room. Like we were in the room and I could tell they really liked the work. You know, like we presented and I could really feel that the board that ultimately was produced was like, we kept going back to it and yeah. talking about it. And you could see the Russos were like, kind of like, see, I told you, <laughs> you know, they didn't say that, but I couldn't feel it. And, and Mind you could, check. yeah. And you could like really feel the energy in the room was like it's one of those real really rare special experiences absolutely yeah absolutely it was pretty 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 amazing so at this point Sarovsky's three years old now we're going on 14 13 yeah we're, I want to say we're almost at 15 somehow That's, I don't know how does that feel looking back it feels like like three or four different companies yeah and I, I think it's supposed to it just evolves into the next thing yeah and I think like at certain scales you're you feel different and then obviously like people have changed which i've gotten much more used to and yeah like in the beginning when it you either had to leave, let somebody go or somebody leaves you there's like so much energy around it yeah. and it really is very impactful and now i've like just kind of come to understand as like a natural part of the process um and it's like for neither good nor bad you know what right. i mean it just right. will be what it will be but it's a it's just like an interesting thing yeah looking back like that but it so, doesn't necessarily there's definitely progression but it there you know when you were back in racine it was nothing like here and then producing these large scale you know like winter soldier took over the studio well, like I we imagine. were all working on that like maybe there were some other little things going on but it was all about that and now we have like two maybe three of those going on at any one time so like the energy is just it's not like pew pew like like no big deal but it's also like okay we know how this flows the technology is in place we have the right artists available like you know it's just a different so there's different. there's one thing i've always admired about you and the more i more i learn about sarovsky over the years and stuff it feels very different than than a lot of the design shops that i i, I mingle with and what i mean by that is everyone's running a business and everyone's doing a really good job at it but this feels different and I couldn't put my finger on it until recently I read a book called um, Traction by Gina Wickman. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar or not. No, but now I want to read it. I uh, it. It basically talks about how you put certain people in certain roles. You let them do their job. You trust them. And then you mm -hmm. kind of just step up and, mm -hmm. and kind of assign things. 
And I realized from the outside looking in, it feels like Swarovski, Swarovski really does that. Mm-hmm. I'm hiring you for a job. You do your thing. I'll trust you with it. And you can grow and scale and, yeah. and kind of keep going bigger. It feels more of a corporation than just a mom and pop shop. Um, has that always, is that A, is that true? Yeah, I would definitely say that's true. And B, has that always been your intention from, from day one? I would say, like, I don't know what my intention was from day one. I have, like, no idea what my intention was. I think my people always ask that question, like, oh, you must have always wanted a studio. And I would say I've always wanted to be a creative lead. I've always wanted to run projects and to develop relationships with clients and artists. and But I've never always wanted to run a studio and even yeah. now I don't know <laughs> but um yeah I, I we definitely are like that now everybody has their role and I trust them to do it and I trust them to ask when they when they need it I think starting out like my role has changed maybe that's why when I look back I see four different companies because in the beginning I wasn't just a creative director I was like doing a you lot were doing work. everything yeah, yeah I was like but those some of those early jobs, like I was like half an animation team as well, you know. So I'd be like taking notes, and I'm like, okay, you do these four, and I'll do these four, and like da 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 da. And then you know, eventually hiring creative directors, and so it, in the beginning, like hiring creative directors or promoting people into creative directors, I made like kind of terrible decisions, yeah. um, because I didn't necessarily look at compatibility with me or I assumed a lot of people that were like really talented on the box would be really talented creative directors. Okay. And that's like a hundred percent not true because <laughs> it's just not. Um, I also like people tell you what they want to tell you about themselves or project like this right. is what I am, but there's a reality to actually who you the, are, who they are. And so I, even in my personal life, I tend to think like, oh, this person's telling me, so it must be true instead of necessarily like watching. So that's like a big thing that I've learned learned just personally and professionally in my life Um, to not like listen to the hype, but to actually watch how it is unfolding. Interesting. Interesting. Um, And that's like probably just a good thing overall for somebody to be hearing right now. (laughs) It's just like, oh my God, she's nailing it right there. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's true. Um, And then, once you do kind of find the right people giving them the space that they need to do their own job and to be there so that they can ask you questions and bounce things off and try and kind of protect and encourage but like let mistakes happen yeah Yeah. i but but giving someone the space i imagine especially as you're learning to kind of let go of these roles that can't be an easy thing for you yourself to overcome and it's hard for them to just be like are you cool not seeing this before it goes out (laughs) you really trust me this much this is your company are you cool not being on the call like for net like now i'm just like when it's somebody's job that and they're leading it yeah like The assumption is I'm not going to be on the call unless they ask me to be on the call. Where maybe before the assumption was I was going to be on the call unless for some reason I said I couldn't be on the call. What what caused that switch in your brain to say I don't want to do that anymore? I'm let you let you do your thing. Um. Well, just time. Yeah. Yeah. I think just you know getting confidence in your team and just I think realizing that to grow and to scale and i'm not even talking like a lot of growth because it's not like we're 100 people or anything right, like right. that but even to scale to having more than like six jobs going on I say you there just becomes you know scheduling issues with you being on right. everything and it's it's really nice like if if you can imagine with the number of jobs we have going on at any given time, there could be 20 or 30 jobs going on. I can't, it's like, I can't fathom that. It's like, I'm a new studio owner. I get like one job at a time. Yeah. I mean like, it's just like where I go, I, I'm very, I think heavily involved in new business because as you know, from like even just what we talked about with DK, right. like I can kind of see what it needs to be. But even then I still have my creative leads now doing that. And they're just like, what do you think of this? Or how do you like the presentation as a flow good? Yeah. It's just like so fun not having to do it. But then if they're like, oh my God, I'm in the weeds. I'm like, oh, I got that. <laughs> yep, and yeah, I'll yeah. put it together and they're like, fuck yeah, that helped so much. <laughs> but it's like nice to just, now I'm just like a mentor and a resource and like, and I'll take a punch if something's going on with a client. Like, I don't like when my team gets a little manhandled. Really care about them. Yeah, so I'll be like, no, I'll go out and I'll 
I'll let's, take the heat on this. Let's dive into that a little yeah. bit then, because uh, I've, been, I've been a fly on the wall for a couple of different conversations, and like right now things are kind of slow across, across yeah, the country. Yeah, people are really I, quiet. As I'm talking to, or as, as I'm hearing things right now. Um, and some places are talking about scaling back and just being like, nah, it's going to be me, myself, and one other person, and we'll do everything as freelance. But I'm curious, in a situation like Swarovski here, you have to have those core people as full-time employees yeah, you to guide to and everything else. Yeah. Do you think that you could run a studio of this caliber if you only had freelancers? I think people are trying to. Uh, and so therefore I do think you can, but I do think things are lost. There's like, like somebody like Steven Anderson, who's my managing director, who's been with me for like eight or nine or maybe 10 years. <laughs> I don't know. And then, of course, Gwar Elvez, who's been with me for yep. over 10 years now. Yep. Like he knows this place as well as I do. If something comes up from like four years ago, he's gonna know exactly who worked on it. Like, like there's just efficiencies lost yeah. by having to staff up every time. And a lot of our work is repeat business. So, like for example, Boost Mobile is a big account for us. Um, when they call us, they expect that the people navigating the job with them like understand historically right. what have happened they understand right. like not only do we know brand standards and this and that but if they're reference something like we don't have to go dig it up and unarchive it the person knows what they're talking about right and right we can have that conversation all of that stuff would be lost if you had to staff up every single job it's interesting i i want to share this fun piece of information with you as well uh when i freelance to your like five years ago. It was like two weeks for a junior level position. Okay. Uh, I was, I think I put together a pitch for Mrs. Meyer's soap is what I was working oh, fun. on. Yeah. And I was stressed out. My computer wasn't working properly. Like, like it was all yeah. the uh, expressions. I overloaded it. Okay. It was too much. And Stephen came up and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Hey man, why are you stressed? It's just marketing. Yeah. And that little piece of information like changed my life. Aww. So I got to like, you know, give him two thumbs up, brag on him for a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit kind of back in the beginning uh, as you're kind of going after these jobs, these, these, these um, bids, were these things where you going directly straight to client to find your work mm -hmm. or you find the work through like agencies or just as a production staff? Yeah. How did things start? Yeah. Well, what's interesting. Well, one, that's a great story to hear about Steven because he is that like energy in yeah. the place. And I, it's really nice when like your head producer, basically the head of that side is not a blithering me. No, I, I love you know that man. I mean? He's awesome. <laughs> There's, so it's really important, like, cause that energy trickles down, Yeah, you know? So it's just, I think that's key. Um, but okay. For new business people like when, oh, okay. I'm like, like, oh, like <laughs> that was a lot there. I yeah, kind of like, I was like, hard left turn. I had like two ways that this could go. I had a real yellow brick moment, yellow brick road moment. There's two thoughts I'm having on this. One is like often I'm asked by, um, contemporaries out there that are thinking about starting their own business they'll call and be like hey can i have like an informational interview with you and just kind of pick your brain yeah they're like i want to make a company just like yours and me <laughs> against you and i'm like okay what do you want to know and they're like asking all of these questions but they never ask like the one question that's like the most important question is oh, how, no, are like, you, how are you how are you going to get work how are you going to get work where's the work going to come from and I always like lob that out there and I'm like, okay, well, where's the work coming from? Is, do you have like clients that are ready to start tossing stuff your way or what? And it's shocking the number of the, how very little thought is given to this sometimes before people start a business. I think people think they're going to put a website out there. And everyone's going to care. everybody's going to care. Yep. <laughs> and let me tell you, nobody's going to care. Yep. Nobody's going to have, nobody's going to give a fuck. Yep. No matter how beautiful your work is. Even if you sell amazing NFTs, nobody's going to care because in the commercial world, it's, it's like track record and relationships and kind of proving yourself over and over and over again, small scale to grow to large scale. Like for me, it started with that one job, but also with like that easy Mac and tag, you know what I mean? Like in a rotary a commercial for like Rotary International and, you know, there's no winter soldier without community, right. without happy endings, without doing a whole bunch of other things that are but even easy max not your mom and pop shop no but it, i mean it's it's a big brand but it's it's not going to get somebody fired if it blows up 
in your face. Okay, okay. It's a good, like an easy Mac and tag is a good little tester job for a studio. Do you think that the skills and experience you had from DK pitching and those type of projects is what directly led to taking up that level of work when you started Swarovski? Yes, definitely. Yeah? Like, not necessarily the opportunity to get that work, but definitely once the opportunities were there to being able to land it. How did you open those doors? So that has to do with like new business. Early in the day, early in the day, early days, <laughs> I was rep by a woman, a traditional kind of rep structure. Yeah. Woman Tracy Bernard here in town was repping me and she was able to pull in some work here and there. Um, and then once, uh, and then, you know, of course, the community thing just came from a little bit of name recognition, and we had a rep on that side, too. And, uh, you know, so it just, it just takes one, like, I think if you look on the entertainment side, everything can be traced back to community. It's a little tree of life there. That's cool. You know, because even if it led to a job that was like, oh, shameless, you know what I mean? Somebody's then looking at shameless, and then that's the reason I'm getting a call for that job. So yeah. it's just like an interesting it's an interesting paradigm, but on the and but on the commercial side, it is very early days was very old school rep model, um, and I had a Midwest rep, but it was very very hard to land. It was first of all, I still don't have West Coast representation, um, and eventually, Tracy and I parted ways. I don't even remember if it was her or me, but like we were a small potato shop, so it didn't. It right. wasn't like we were like her lifeblood, right? <laughs> anyway. Right. And for me. Um, it was all about landing uh, representation on the East Coast and eventually Judy Wolf, who is now like on our team full time doing business development. Um, she eventually came around and took us on. So she's she's a little bit different than like other, rep, you know, business development people or reps. Yep. Like I'm specific to not call her a rep because she does business development. She kind of looks for places that we would be appropriate for and finds the right people to connect us with and it's much more thoughtful <laughs> than just like here's a board here's a there like board cold slingers email, cold email. <laughs> you know where everything's an emergency and you got to put a pitch together and it's really competitive but is it even a job yet like right. you don't even know what's going on internally yep. like you like you know judy's very entrenched with us um I would say that's like one of the hardest aspects of running a business especially a business like this like nothing's retainer um, there's just relationships, but like there was a point in our evolution where we had two big main clients and within the same year, both those agencies lost that business, which means that business goes away for us too. And nothing that we did, it's just like, so you really have to learn to diversify and to, <clears throat> even if you're small enough where you just need two main clients, you you have to have an iron in all the fires to be having yet another two clients because those two could go away. So Got that it. taught me like, like big, big time. <laughs> <laughs> that taught me big time to like diversify, to have, you know, not just, you know, big cool tech jobs and big cool entertainment jobs, but like have a good consistent flow of pharma work, have yeah. a good consistent flow of communications work and car work and this and that. Not every industry is going to go down all simultaneously. So, that's interesting because you, you hear a lot of people say, you know, the riches are in the niches, um, you know, find one thing and specialize in it. But you don't you don't feel that that's the case. I feel like if you ask tech people, people that are only doing work for <laughs> Facebook and Google right now, that question, you're going to have your answer. You know, you have a good point there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's for sure. Okay. For sure. Okay. Everything goes in cycles. So the thing about it is, though, like if if there really is if the economy takes a dive who still advertise like you know boost is still going to be out there making commercials because they're going to have to be competitive and say like instead of three phones you're going to get four phones and the package is going to be this much a month yep, yep. and at the end of the day like people are going to have to communicate with their customers and say we're still okay everything's fine like we saw that through the pandemic we yeah. were really like there for a lot of our clients that like didn't exactly know how to go out and do that but it's like just start sending us words and we'll start making things and we'll <laughs> eventually you're gonna be excited about it and we'll go out you know but so as Sarovsky, are you guys heavily involved in the strategy behind what these ads are going to be or is it this is the idea this is what we need go make it so most of the time it is that but we are launching another division of the studio Ooh. called Swarovski TBD. There's actually a little button at the bottom of the website now Exciting. in our main nav. Probably nobody's clicked on it. But TBT, uh, TBD is obviously to be, you know, 
discussed, to be determined, to be defined. So it's that strategy and ideation department. Clever, I like that. The studio. Um, and I'm really excited about that. Uh, Kimberly Kadena is going to be our, is, not is going to be, is our lead strategist and Eddie Schneider, who I've worked with since Digital Kitchen. We go over 20 years back. Nice. Yeah, he is going to lead creative. Talk about building those, those relationships again. I'm telling you, like, it's, <laughs> it, you know, that's what it is, right? It is all relationships. I love it. It is all, it comes down to the end of the day, like, with your team, with your clients, with everything. They got to be able to trust you. And, you know, it's like, at the end of the day, like, for exactly, for an easy Mac and tag, um, nobody's going to lose their job if we right. fuck it up. Right. But we're working at scale on jobs where people literally might lose their job if we if we don't deliver and we we know that and we think about that and we make sure that they're communicated with and they know where they're at with things and i say they they don't just pay for the outcome they pay for the process you know which is why we're very producer heavy here makes sense that makes yeah. sense uh so i'm curious being coming up on 15 years now looking back at all you've accomplished what is your your highlight highlight is probably winter soldier yeah because that for me was like a real pivot point. Absolutely. Um, I love community. I love that community moment and story. I've, I think about that woman being me in that room with those people and think, fuck, you were so brave. <laughs> oh my God, why did you go to that meeting? That's so crazy. You know, um, I think there's been a lot of moments like that, but there's also, you know, there were some hard moments too. Like when I talk about like things drying up a little bit or losing big yeah. accounts and being like, what do we do? And, you know, Steven Anderson has been like an amazing part of that journey. And then when I eventually grew up and did have a baby and family and just realizing how that actually impacts things and how that's given me more empathy than ever yeah. for my team and for their work-life balance. Um, but how, you know, like, I feel like we're a different kind of studio. There's like so much respect going both ways. So we don't like tell people they're working the weekend. We ask them, you know, we prepare, we pay people if they do work the weekend. It's not, <laughs> you know, we're the end of the line, so there's always going to be stuff. But I imagine that a lot. But we're you know, trying. A lot of the time, you might have the the headway or the lead time to know in three weeks we need to ramp up and scale up a little yes, bit. Yes, we're getting so better with that. It's not like you're yeah. working tomorrow. It's yeah. Hey guys, all hands on deck next week. Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're kind of coming up close to our hour in time here, so I guess okay. I want to wrap things up with one quick piece, which is uh, the sub goal of Frame One is to inspire the next generation of freelancers that want to start freelancing, or okay. those that are freelancing to start studios if they want to do that. Being where you are here today, if you could give one little piece of advice, oh I know you got to like boil it down uh, to someone that that is thinking about either starting in freelancing, starting their own company. What would you tell them? Well, for freelancing, I would ask why, like. Or even like having a company of your own, like why? <laughs> what do you, I wish somebody would have asked me why I wanted to do it. It's really painful it's to really talk. Hard. Well, I mean, like you know, the reward can be large. Like there are some years Absolutely. where we do really well, and all but that you do suffer a little bit for it. But also, if there's a year where it's short, you're short, you know. And um, you know, people say that you know, isn't it great working for yourself? But like. The real reality is, is you have even more clients because your team is dependent on you and your clients are dependent on you. And um, it's, I'm going to use this analogy, even though it's not like when you start a boutique company, it's like you're not the mill or the frame store or frame store, right? Like as the owner, people know who you are and they're going to call you. That's why they're, that's why they're working with you. Like if I'm working with frame store or the mill, like, who is even the owner? <laughs> Who do I call if I want to bitch about something? Right. Or if something, if I'm not happy with my team or something's not going well, who do I even want to call if something's going great? So I think like this, the romantic idea of opening a studio is like just that. It's a romantic idea. But there are some major things. But I would say like go into it with like a balanced notion of what it's going to be and i think the big things are is have a lot of money saved up have money saved because cash flow is something that you don't think about and nobody talks to you about at any given time half of your receivables can be over 60 days yep 
late. So that means like if you paid out all your freelancers and everything in 45 days for as long as they're going, you're basically funding organizations. And like you can't make money magically appear. No matter how many times you call them, they're going to send you the money when they send you the money. <laughs> so you have to be very conservative with money and you have to have a lot of cash saved up. But I want all the toys. <laughs> <laughs> no, you got to have a lot of cash. You got to have cash on hand. And it's proportional. So if you're just starting out freelancing, have three months. Have three months in the bank so that if if you're on hold, <laughs> you know, you're not freaking out. You know what Absolutely. I mean? You're like Absolutely. You're, you're, it's okay. And then enjoy, and then you can enjoy that time off instead of freaking out about it. Yep. Right? And then on the, on the business side, I would say also um, have a lot of cash. And if you are looking for a line of credit, make sure you get your line of credit when you have the cash because people will only give you the exact amount of money you have in cash. It is oh, a very weird thing. That is good to know. They will never say that to you, but that is true. That as is a, a good... as a business, so if you're like, God, I really need a half a million dollar line of credit because it seems but like- But I've got 10 grand in the bank. You're not gonna get. <laughs> and it's a, even if you have like signed contracts with people and the work's coming in, you don't got money, they ain't giving you money. Good so to know. when you when you have cash on hand, that's when you get your lines of credit. And then don't use your fucking line of credit <laughs> unless you actually need it. need it as a line of credit. As like, oh my God, they're about to pay me, but they haven't paid me, but this thing is due. So I'm going to dip into it. I'm going to borrow against myself and then use it to pay it off. Don't like let it keep thinking like somehow magically you're going to pay it off. I feel like yeah. there's a lot I could learn from you. Oh yeah, well, feel free to call. I can keep talking, and I can keep talking. It doesn't have to be an hour. Awesome. Well, if you want to keep going, yeah, let's, I'm totally let's keep happy going. To. Let's I'm, keep going. Yeah, have the rest of the day. Um, let's see here. I need to find a new question to ask then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big one. The money thing is a big one that most people don't ask about or think let's about. Let's talk about that a little bit then. Um, so, for example, I started my my studio in January. Okay. Uh, we we booked a couple of contracts. We put about thirty grand in the bank. It was you know, not not too much, but not you know. It's that's it's something. It's money to get to get going. That's real money. Uh, if you had limited funds to start over Sarovsky, where would you go? How would you utilize those those funds? Oh my God! I just go on like a cruise. <laughs> I don't think my business partner would appreciate that. Um, no. Where, what do you mean? What would I do? What would I? If, if you wanted to grow this, the sum of, of, of money, and it can be any amount, let's say like less than 50 grand, uh, and you were going to grow it into the next big corporation, okay. what would be your roadmap of saying, okay, I'm going to put money into advertising, I'm going to put money into uh, resources, X, Y, Z, to kind of get yeah. things going? You know, now it's so interesting. It's a totally different time. I'd make sure you have like a decent website, you know, it, but that doesn't have to cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, but I put some energy and time into social. Yeah. Doing what you're doing here, building a podcast, becoming a voice in the community, but also make sure that you're not just talking to your own people, but the people that need to be hiring you, you know? Ooh. So Ooh. this is a big thing. Like when we do our social now, we're, we're, we're trying to share stuff that is not just like me and Dryston will like it. You right, know what right. I mean? It's, you know, like check out this new Houdini render. <laughs> yeah. But we're trying to be like, let's think about architecture. Let's think about art. Let's think about fashion. Let's just think about pop culture, all of that stuff. Cause that's what's going to draw agency people to you and people with work. Yeah. There's a fun question. How much of your work is direct to client versus through agency? You know, that's interesting. It's really changing now. Yeah. But, but, there's always a but. So it used to be like agency represents a client. Very simple, easy to imagine. Now a client, so if you go direct to brand, they could have a fully formed ad agency in their thing, in their kind of system where okay. they have from their CMO all the way down, yeah. like a full agency of people. So like Verizon has a giant agency. Yeah. Currently, we're working with Huntington Bank, and they have a big agency. I wouldn't say big, but like substantial yeah. and very talented people. So, so when you work direct with a brand, what that looks like is always a little bit of a surprise. Because <laughs> sometimes it might mean that they have very robust infrastructure like that of an agency. And sometimes it means they got a guy. <laughs> Just kind of throwing darts at a wall. Throwing darts at a wall. And that's where I think like our offering of strategy and ideation is going to be great because, you know, we can come in and say, hey, like, do you really, can we think this through for you? Like, we see you got this mm -hmm. thing going here and it's got like legs and obviously right, it makes right. sense. But can we, 
maybe break this out into three separate scripts and think about some strategy and all of that, where it's going to go, how it's going to go, what's your media look like. Ask, start asking some bigger questions like that without stepping on people's toes. Right. So, I, so they just look differently. So when you say direct to client, it's, you know, it might be 50, 50 now, but within that direct to client, a few of them are like fully functional agencies where it's just like being at an agency, except they're not doing new business. <laughs> and when, because they're not doing new business, that means that their teams are just more into the work that they're doing and not being pulled in multiple directions. Dedicated. And yeah. It's Dedicated. really a different vibe. That's yeah. interesting. That's interesting. So as far as growing the studio, if there's one point outside of winter soldier, because I know that was a big pivoting point. Uh, but like I said earlier, uh, I should start with the question over real quick here. Earlier, I'd mentioned that that some studios that I've been talking to kind of feel that two to three marks when they kind of find their stride. Ten years is kind of when they're mm -hmm. like they're crushing it. Yeah, has that felt true for you as well? I mean, crushing it is such an interesting thing. I a part of what I'm trying to decide now is like, what do I want to be? Yeah, like I feel like there's always this like maybe it's like a very masculine thing, but more, 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 more bigger 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 right. grow 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 if you're not growing you're dying right and to a certain extent like i agree with that but but now as a, a business owner i want to be efficient i still want to do great work i i can see kind of where the end of the truman show the wall is yeah. where it kind of starts to fall apart and through my career, I've watched the rise and fall of all of these big, amazing studios. And you, it's like really time for me to take a step back and say, like, how big do I want to be? Right. Like, where is it that we can be the most impactful from just visual, uh, creating amazing content, creating legacy content, creating content that makes us good money so that we can all have good family, you know, so have 401ks and college right. funds and just pay people really, really well. Um, and that I can make a lot of money <laughs> too, you know what I mean? So that, but also so that I can be um, growing a company that's big enough where like I'm not essential in everything all the time. And that kind of goes back to that operations thing yes. we were talking about earlier. So it's, um, it's an interesting thing and I'm kind of at this phase in my life where I'm really thinking about that. How do I create something sustainable, something not even that's manageable, but something that's sustainable doing all of those things like yeah. the best it can do so not constantly like striving for something that's so big and whether it's in reach or out of reach but like like doing it with more intention and purpose um yeah well let's let's dive into that for a second uh you said that people don't buy a product they buy a process yeah how long did it take you to figure out your process Oh my God, we're still figuring out our process. Anybody that says their process is figured out is totally full of shit. That's an industry secret. <laughs> First of all, like the technology is like the carrot that we are chasing. It's kind of constantly be evolving. So just pipeline and all of that is going to be a constant evolution. Um, truths that I thought were like steadfast, like about having a studio space and having yeah. that reflect your values and your like, artistry and all of that stuff now people like want to work at home and i'm like but what about this big beautiful space that i built you know what i mean like where's the balance like what does that look like now so for me it's been you know i i feel like i can have like those first guttural reactions of like that's fucking stupid right you know right, forget right. that but then like you you have to live in that and think about it and let it you let yourself evolve um into what does that new normal kind of look like here and for us and what what is okay with you and what is not okay with you and if it's not okay with you being okay that it's not okay with you and like kind of setting your boundaries and then people know where you're at so there's no wishy-washiness makes sense yeah. makes sense uh another question i had for you uh i know you do some speaking kind of yeah. all over the place how did you get into that people asked yeah yeah you know if i'm being very direct <laughs> which often I am, <laughs> you know, like I'm a woman, people need women to talk. Um, there's not a lot of women, especially at my age in the mid forties and older in our industry. So I think people have definitely, um, you know, like, especially early on, like, Oh my God, we got a woman. She's Absolutely. great. She's, she'll talk, she'll stay, she'll, she'll be present. She's smart. She's got this. Let's do yeah, it. Yeah. And she's doing great work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like, there's that aspect of it. So I think early on it was just, you know, 
Oh, great. Like we got so a woman that does you. motion design. Yeah, I did. Is this something that you wanted to do? To do? No. Just kind of got like, oh, no. that's and interesting. And now I kind of feel obligated to do it. Interesting. Because I do feel like it's important for women to see women out yeah. there. And I think, you know, like it or not, I did name my studio my name. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I have to be a brand ambassador for it, you know. And that if I'm doing my job right in like the next few years, it's going to probably mean more of that. Yeah. And more hanging out with clients and making relationships and doing kind of like, I don't know, I'm never going to learn to play golf, but I feel like it's like the equivalent of playing golf. Whatever it is to me, it's going to be like that, you know, but I'm not going to learn how to play golf. Oh, that's really funny. That's really funny. You know, I hope I don't have to play golf. I'm I know. Be terrible. Oh my God. It's like, I need clients that don't want to play golf. I've, I've played <laughs> golf exactly three times in my life and all three have got a nightmare horror story. So yeah. I don't do that. I don't do that. I'll play mini golf. That's fun. That's yeah, fun. See, but that's a different kind of client. You're right. That is, that's the fun client. That's, <laughs> that's the client I want to work with. And that's where I'm at. That's low too. stress. <laughs> yeah. But it's hard. Like that moves you further and further away from the work, but it moves me closer and closer to relationship, which is what I love Yeah. and value more than anything. I think. At this How much point. time do you get to spend on the box still? You're not a lot. Yeah. No, not a lot at all, but I'm okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun, like, when you do go in, like, how, like, the ninja skills, pew, pew, yeah. you, like, kind of crack your elbows, and you're like, oh, yeah, da 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 Got this, crush it, yeah, there we go. Yeah, you crush it, or somebody, like, I'll, I'll, like, kind of, I always do this thing where somebody will send me something, and, I'll, like, I'll give feedback, and I'm, like, I know it's me, like, I'm not saying it right, so this is what I mean, and I'll, like, underscore like save their file and it's yeah. like underscore Aaron eyes. <laughs> you know, send it back. I and like I'll that never, as a verb. <laughs> yeah, and I'll never like um, take it all the way there. And it's never like a mandate, but it's like, this is what I'm talking about. Right. Like, poof, you know, it's pretty funny. I like that. Yeah. So being in a position now where you're kind of able to be a little more hands off, mm -hmm. kind of let people kind of trust them and do, do their, 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 their jobs. Uh, what, what is the next step? What is, how does Swarovski evolve from here? I mean, just, managing it's not necessarily more work it's like more work that we want to do mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're saying no a lot which is like my is that favorite scary thing. is that powerful oh my god that's amazing yeah it's so great to say no <laughs> but it, the crazy thing is when you say no and you like want to do the work but you don't have the bandwidth for it or mm -hmm. something like that there were a few things that this year in 2023 alone that we had to turn down that like hurt physically to yeah. turn down like the artist in me was like we have to but we can't we have to do this. this is a highly visible it's beautiful i've always wanted to work with these clients like all the things but those are all the reasons you say no because if you fuck that job up it's gone it's gone forever it's gone forever because again the process no matter how good it ends up if we can't really start the job when they need it and we are like kind of Ooh, tap yeah. dancing around it yeah. and we knew people were going to be booked for a while on other things and you know it's just really you can't fuck over people you have to like you can't say yes to everything <laughs> when you have a medium-sized team so yeah. over the years the times you've been able to say no have you noticed that it, it comes back around and yeah, always comes always back around. people appreciate it yeah they never forget you actually because nobody says no interesting people say yes and then they fuck it up it sounds like an industry hack to be honest yeah. I mean, take your first year off, say no to everybody. <laughs> yeah, right. Make, make no money. Make no money. No, but I think that's like really, you know, if you're not sure if you can do it, it's not going to don't, be, don't it's take not gonna be worth it. Yeah. Interesting. Like there's enough. a certain amount of risk we're comfortable with and a certain amount of risk I'm like very uncomfortable with. How do you come to those decisions? We talk about it. Yeah. We talk about it as a team. Yeah. We, we get our holds, we see who's available, you know, we, and then we have like a, a come to Jesus, the creative directors and Steven and Joel, and we come together and we sit down and we're like, okay, we have to make a hard decision. We can say two yeses and one no. These are all, got it. These are all yeses, but there are Which two ones? yeses and one no. You know? And this is not a, an ability where you can just scale up and find more people for those. Mm-mm. Is it no. just a lack of, of the top tier talent you're looking for? Or is it the uh, internal like ability to manage everything? Well, I mean, like all of them are high security typically when you're in like a situation like that. So I think it all has to be in the bubble. Got it. Um, Got it. There's, we have 
four four creative directors now, like maybe a fifth, depending on like what happens in the next few months. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like it's uh and there's a lot of other work going on too. Yeah. So like at any given time, like a boost can pop up, a pharma in there's so much of that other stuff that people need to be available for that too. And we just knew like it's a two, not a three. You know? Got it. Got it. It just was a uh, universal truth. There it was, was a universal truth. We all knew it, but mm -hmm. they we really wishy washed on which ones we gotcha. went for. And what the crazy thing is, is we we turned down the new client and we moved forward with the stuff that were old clients. Right. And because we figured the devil we knew was better than the one we don't. And we we knew that we could at least. Um, well, one, we're always honest <laughs> for, for better or worse, but we we didn't want to have to tap dance with a new major Got player. It. Got it. No, I understand that. I respect mm -hmm. that. That's, that's kind of yeah. scary. And then we cool. won both those jobs. So nice. If we <laughs> it would have been catastrophic <laughs> if we went for all three and then and it's also expensive to pitch. That's another thing. You If you're starting a business, you got to watch your costs when you're pitching. It can get out of control. You should always figure out what what your risk is. So if the job is $100,000, maybe set a rule for pitching, like you'll never spend more than 10% of the cost of the whole job. So that means that if you do 30% on the job, you really only did 20%, Yep. right? So it's not like they're gonna pay you. You could build it into the job. Sometimes we try and do that, but. Well, I took your, your producing lab a yeah. couple years ago. That was valuable information yeah, for like sure. Yeah, really, really insightful stuff. But like, you gotta really think about, and we're, sometimes we break our own rules there, but you know, we're thinking, God, we only can take two of these jobs. So if we pitch all three and then we only take two of them, one that's like so disrespectful. Right. If you win all three of them right. to then turn one of them down would be like, talk about kind of a slap in the face a little bit. Yeah, that would be extra <laughs> We're glad you like us. No. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> so, out, but there's yeah. kind of a fun question too. How much time do you, how many projects do you spend pitching on versus just they call you and say, make this for us? Oh, single bid. Okay, so first of all, if ever you're thinking about saying no to a job and one is a pitch and one is single bid, the answer is always you go with the single bid. You never pitch on a job if you can avoid it. Yep. Because... We're, as an industry, we're trying to evolve past that. So, like, if you have the option, like, fuck the pitch situation. <laughs> Why would you spend money for somebody else right. if you don't have to? Um, like, without question. That is, like, my industry thing. That is, like, it's, like, really plagued us. Like, decisions that were made, like, early on with those few starting companies doing these like big elaborate pitches um, for nothing has really set us back as a industry because we're giving away a lot of free. Do you think there's work. a world where, where single bids exist only? Oh yeah, I mean, yes and no. Yeah? Yeah, yes and no. How, how does that come to be as a industry standard then? Well, I mean, everybody has to say no. Okay, okay. Um, it would be great if we had like an organization like no, oh, here's the next step for Swarovski, maybe. No. <laughs> no. I saw the hard pass right away. Yeah. Know what lane you're staying out of, and that is it. But, I mean, it would be like an absolute nightmare. <laughs> Plus, like, anybody can do anything they ultimately want, you know, if somebody calls you. Like, I fully know that there are companies out there that say, we do not pitch, period. And then I'll hear we're pitching against them. Mm. So it's like... Like, I don't have a rule about it. If it's a job I'm excited about and I want to pitch, we will. And if it is a job that is asking for a pitch and they're like, there's five companies, no thank you. Um, if it's... I don't want it to be an honor for me to be at, to be at the table. Yeah. If it's like, hey, this is single bid, but we want to go through the development process, fuck yeah. That's what I want to hear every single time. I imagine that strategy thing too, as that starts to become around and, and more and more, um, being able to talk to the client and walk through and actually help like figure out what it is they're trying to do, yeah. almost bids that pitch to be itself while also like bringing them more on board with what they want to create so you have less problems and feedback down the road too. Yeah, it's interesting like yeah. looping strategy and ideation into what would be like a traditional post-production mm -hmm. motion design is 
oftentimes very problematic <laughs> because you're inherently stepping on somebody's toes. It's unfortunate. I mean, like, we definitely, like, do that, but we don't necessarily say that we're doing that. Right. Or, and we, we can't be mad when something goes another direction because um, oftentimes they'll have gone through that process for months and months and months. I think the big thing about Swarovski TBD that's very much surprised me with working direct to client is um, how long things take. Really? Oh, my God. Like, we can crank out a project. <laughs> Like, it seems like overnight. If like, <laughs> like, we make stuff so fast. Even, like, big main titles. We got a couple months. We bang it out. Boom. You know, it's in the world. But, like, you know, getting people aligned on just a brief. Ooh. On deliverables lists. On scope of work. On, you know, some writing methodology of, like, strategy. <laughs> It and almost those, seems like it'd be easier to say, hey, we're going to charge you 10 grand. I'll sit in a room. We're going to workshop this together. Yeah. And we're just going to like figure out what it is you want. Yeah. It's really an interesting, an interesting part of the process. It makes you have like a whole new respect for agencies and what they go through and internally like what they go through. Because just the idea of defining, hey, like we as a company who sells, you know, uh, tires or right. whatever, right. you know. Um, we have a marketing budget that we spend every year. What are you making? Where right. is it going? Who are you appealing to? Like, let's just start very fundamentally there. And that's kind of where that strategy and ideation is. It's like, okay, well, let's talk about your markets. Let's talk about where it would be best to place things. Let's talk, let's talk to that audience. Like, what's our tone of voice? What's all that? That's like really an insane endeavor, you know? And it just takes so much longer. Just getting on people's schedules takes longer. <laughs> just like we can make things in the time it takes to sometimes schedule a call on the other <laughs> side. It's fucking crazy. And so I think that's just something I've learned is just like the speed of things is just different in different categories and different places at different points in the process. And Interesting. Yeah. I would have thought I've been the, the exact same as, you know, we need this revision, but it's going to take 10, 10 rounds of people telling you what they need to get to where you wanted to be at, but it's not mm -hmm. the case, huh? No. Interesting. Because like on the work uh, we do on the production side, there's that paradigm has been set. There, so there is a paradigm for success. We know it needs to be 30 seconds. We know the media is going to go all these places. We know... Um, 16, nine, one by one. We need... Yeah, we... Blah, blah, blah. Like so much has been defined before it even gets to us that it's like a luxury just to be able to crank something out. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I think I'm like, I, I can see I blew your mind there, but it's just like a different ball of wax. Interesting. Just take, takes a little burn is a lot longer. It takes a lot longer. Well, I super appreciate you like hanging out today. Yeah. You know, and congratulations again on new construction for the studio. Thank you. It is always like my happy spot whenever I come to Chicago. Like I'm, I'm so always glad. like gotta stop by and like look at the studio. So Aww, I'm thanks so glad again. you're here. Yeah. yeah. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So uh, as far as Frame 1 goes, thanks again for watching. Like, subscribe, share, review, all that other fun stuff definitely helps out. And uh, thanks again. Thank you again. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>